Hey everyone, welcome back to Decoding Cryptography, a lecture series where we take a detailed look at encryption systems and how they apply in our world today. In today's lecture, we're going to focus only on the polyalphabetic substitution cipher. In the last video, we set a very barebone stage for understanding encryption and how it was used in a historical context. We started by looking at three characters that will play an important role for all encryption in the future, known as Alice, Bob, and Eve. We then looked at, specifically, the monoalphabetic substitution cipher, which is, in many ways, a one-to-one -one relationship between the plaintext alphabet that represents the message space and the ciphertext alphabet, which is used to create the ciphertext. After that, we took a look at the homophonic substitution cipher, which is really a flavor of the monoalphabetic substitution cipher, where you have a one-to-many relationship, with the one being the plaintext alphabet and the many being the cipher alphabet. And in this case, we found that for both of these schemes, you could actually use the language rules of the English language or whatever language the message is written in, and still be able to break the encryption scheme using methods such as frequency analysis. And so this was the biggest flaw associated with the monoalphabetic substitution cipher, is this one-to-one -one or one-to-many relationship always tied back to a single letter in the plain text alphabet, and this is how you crack it. In this video, we're going to focus all of our efforts on understanding the polyalphabetic substitution cipher, which is, unlike the monoalphabetic substitution cipher, a many-to-many -many relationship between letters in the plain text alphabet and the cipher alphabet. And so this is going to add additional security properties that we will discuss later. We'll also look at an implementation of this from history known as the Visionaire cipher, which was actually a cipher that was not broken until almost 300 years later in the 1800s. And we'll look at how that cipher was broken. So this video really only serves one single purpose, and that is to set the stage for understanding our first introduction into modern day encryption known as the one-time pad, and we'll discuss what that means in a later lecture. Let's begin. So if you're familiar with the monoalphabetic substitution cipher, then the its poly counterpart is really not that much different, with the exception of using more than one cipher alphabet to encode your message. In this example, I will use one plain text alphabet and two cipher alphabets labeled C1 and C2. So I list out the letters of the plain text alphabet, A, B, C, D, and so on and so forth. And then I have different representations for each cipher alphabet. In C1, you can see I have Q, J, K, Z, W. In C2, I have X, Y, Q, M, and J, and so on and so forth. And so what I can do here is I can alternate between using C1 and C2 to encode my message into the resulting ciphertext. And this is generally how polyalphabetic substitution ciphers work. The strength of this encryption method is that you can kind of see from this example, if I have Q as an eavesdropper in my ciphertext, then this could be either A or C. And so I'd have a very tough time of using frequency analysis to determine which letter it represents, because it could represent both. This is how the polyalphabetic substitution cipher defends itself against frequency analysis. So let's take a look at a historical example developed in the 1550s known as the Visionaire cipher, or le chiffre indechiffrable, which means the indecipherable cipher. In order to determine which cipher alphabet to use to encrypt a given message or letter in a message, the Visionaire cipher uses a keyword that it repeats throughout the entirety of the message. All right, let's look at how you read this thing. So on the top row, you have the plain text alphabet. And this is going to be essentially uh, what you're using to encrypt your message. On the left-hand column, what you have is actually the set of cipher alphabets with each row. So if the keyword starts with an A, then you use the first row for that first letter, and so on and so forth. So say, for example, we have the letter C in our plain text and the keyword starts with an M. Well, if you go to the row and column corresponding to that, then what you do is you encrypt that letter C as an O. You follow this exact same process for the next letter in your plain text message, as well as the next letter in your keyword cipher. And then this is done until the entire message is encrypted. 
Now, the visionary cipher had, wasn't broken for almost 300 years until a Prussian uh, officer in the military known as Frederick Kosicki, as well as a British inventor known as Charles Babbage, found a way to break it. Now, let's take a look at how they broke this cipher. In this example, I have the following plain text message. The buffalo from buffalo buffaloed my buffalo. My oh my. And I use a keyword cat in order to encrypt this message using the visionary cipher. And so I follow the row C in the cipher alphabet, the row A in the cipher alphabet, and the row T in the cipher alphabet for each letter. And I do this until the entire message is encrypted, as displayed below. Take a closer look at the letter F in the plain text alphabet in buffalo and buffalo and buffaloed and buffalo. What you notice is that the letter F in the ciphertext is actually represented by three different letters, Y, H, and F, in different combinations. So this is why it's very hard to break using frequency analysis. So the question I pose to you, and you can pause the video here if you'd like to, is what would you do in order to break this? So you might notice in the ciphertext that certain strings of characters repeat themselves, such as D-U-Y-H-A-E-Q, multiple times, as well as other characters such as U-W-F-Y-C-L-H and O-Y-O-Y. Now this is how we're going to break this encryption cipher, is by looking at the distance between these repeating strings. For D-U-Y-H-A-E-Q, it's 18 letters, for the next one, it's 18 letters, and then for OY, OY, it's 9 letters. So what do these numbers have in common? Well, they're all multiples of 1, 3, and 9. And what this means in practice is that the keyword length has to be one of these factors, either 1, 3, or 9. Now, if we were to do this for a longer ciphertext, we'd be able to essentially count up the frequency with which uh, a factor occurs given uh, certain repeating strings. And what we will determine is what the actual final keyword length is using this method. And so now what we can do is we can represent the keyword using the letters K1, K2, and K3. Assuming, of course, we do this multiple times and find out that we get the factor 3 occurring over and over again. And so what we've just done is that we've found three unique ciphertext alphabets that can use frequency analysis in order to be broken. For K1, we have V, D, H, Q, Q, W, and so on and so forth. For K2, we have H, U, A, F, M, F, L, and so on and so forth. And then for the final one, we have X, Y, E, K, U, Y, and H, and then so on and so forth. So as discussed before, the K1 message is going to be a ciphertext encrypted only using the letter C in the visionary cipher, K2 only using the letter A, K3 only using the letter T. And so this is how we break the visionary cipher, is piecemeal like this. And so what went wrong here? Well, really, the visionary cipher suffers from two glaring issues, really the same glaring issue, is the fact that we had to reuse the keyword. And the reason we had to reuse the keyword is because the keyword was shorter than the message length. And so this is what enabled us to find patterns in the ciphertext. And once we find patterns in the ciphertext, we gain knowledge about what the keyword was. And so this is the problem with the visionary cipher. And once it was discovered that this method could be used, it was no longer secure. However, what if we did not have an encryption method where the keyword was shorter than the message length? Well, this is known as the one-time pad, and it's going to be the subject of our next discussion. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Nolan, and this is Decoding Cryptography. Please like this video and share it with your friends.